It is my pleasure now, our pleasure, to introduce Glenn Simpson. Glenn is many things. He's a person in long-term recovery. He's a former rock and roll roadie in wardrobe. He's a recent graduate of the Applied Arts and Social Justice Certificate Program in the UNE School of Social Work. He is a social worker. He's an artist. He's an activist. I first met Glenn when he applied for a grant to develop Pieces of Recovery, the Puzzle Project, which you can see some of out here. This isn't the full project. It goes um, many, many more feet that our lobby just couldn't encompass. Um, and we funded it, and it has grown tremendously since then. If you haven't seen the Puzzle Project in the state of Maine over the last year, you've been hiding under a rock. The work was inspired by the AIDS quilt of the 80s, many of you here will remember that, and fueled by an unshakable conviction that connection is the opposite of addiction. Glenn's puzzle project is visually appealing, it's emotionally complex, and manages to inspire curiosity, it draws you in, and it remains urgently, brutally, and necessarily direct. When you get into each puzzle piece, there's a person there, a person who has been struggling, a person who is on their recovery journey. It's a lot of lifting for a piece of art to do, but the Puzzle Project and this artist both do it with style. So please welcome Glenn Simpson. Thank you, thank you. You know, when folks ask me to uh, come up here and do the uh, keynote at the harm reduction, you know, conference and talk about how I got it all wrong, I said yes. <laughs> I can't think of anything uh, that I'd rather do on a random Friday in October of just come here and tell you how I got it all wrong. Um, appreciate you all for, uh, for being here. I want to tell you about I want to tell you about a woman I met. Judy was in her late 30s when I first met her. She'd been living with and suffering from a significant substance use disorder. She had a long history of crack cocaine use, benzodiazepines, alcohol, and an opiate use disorder. When I first met her, she was experiencing homelessness. She had walked to the center that day. She had her, she had her backpack filled with everything that she owned. She spent her last three bucks to take two buses to step into her treatment that day. She told me about how when the weather was better, she liked to, to sleep in the woods behind the dog park because folks who owned dogs were just a little kinder. Judy had the imprint of trauma on her journey from a very young age. She talked about how when she was 16, she had run away from home and the madness that she had experienced there, they'd bring her back, they'd bring her back, Finally, she ended up at a school, and she ran away from there, too. She was 16 years old. It was a December night. She was laying face down in a field in just her jeans and a t-shirt, and they're looking for her with flashlights. They never found her, but somebody did. And that man trafficked her for the next decade. Judy came to us through the Department of Health and Human Services. She had lost custody of her young son. They were trying to, they were trying to reconnect. Those folks that held the keys, they had some requirements. She needed to be sober. She needed to be in recovery. She needed to provide clean urine screenings if she was going to have a relationship with her son again. So we got a woman that's battered and broken, 
and just worn out since she was a child. Yet, there was something in her eyes. There was a spark. There was, there was a glimmer of hope. That's what I saw. And when I started working with her, I simply asked her, what do you want your recovery to look like? You know, Glenn Simpson, the social worker, Glenn Simpson, the man in recovery, I had an idea of what I wanted Judy's recovery to look like, but I just simply asked her, Judy, what do you want your recovery to look like? And she simply said, I want a safe place to lay my head at night when I don't feel good. I want a safe place to put my head at night when I don't feel good. <clears throat> Spiritual awakenings sometimes come in rude awakenings, and that was like the aha moment for me. That's when things really began to shift in the way that I thought about the work that many of us here do. That's when I realized that everything I thought I knew about recovery was wrong. For Judy, not living in the daily grind of addiction was recovery. To be able to put your head down when you don't feel well, be able to have a friend over for coffee in your own house, be able to take your son to fun town, maybe have a dog of your own one day. That was recovery for Judy. She didn't mention alcohol, drugs, 12-step programs, IOPs, treatment plans. As she continued her journey with us, eventually she became uh, the greeter for our group. Judy was a very, sort of, how do I put it, enthusiastic person. She became a greeter for a group when folks were coming in, pulling open that thousand pound door to step into their treatment. They saw Judy in her smiling face. She was dressing up. Eventually people thought she worked there. She was doing work there, right? About 10 weeks later, and her time was up with us, her case manager had been working hard to find some housing for Judy and it wasn't happening. Judy had been on the waiting list for Section 8 for three or four years at that point. And I remember that day that Judy, she just simply started packing up her things, back into that backpack, everything that she owned. No anger, no tears, no sadness, just a silent determination to take another step forward. Just to keep going. It wasn't long after that that we were able to find a recovery residence uh, for Judy to go to. I remember we told her the news and she could finally just see the crack up here in her. And you could see the excitement and the terror of what that life was going to look like. I mean, Judy had found a recovery that worked for her. She knew the well-worn path of the previous life, but she was carving out this new path. She was like, I don't know, the, the Laura Croft of recovery. Carving out her own path, what recovery looked like for her. I mean, Judy's one of the she's one of the most courageous people that I've ever met. She helped me see the world differently. I began to see substance use differently. I began to see recovery differently. I began to see my own story differently. You know, I used to tell people that um, entering into recovery was going to be the hardest thing that you ever do in your life. The way that I think about it now, stepping into the recovery is the most courageous thing that someone can do with their life. 
I learned that from Judy. So it can be a bit disconcerting to do a 180 degree turn on your beliefs and admit that everything I thought about, I knew about recovery was wrong. Today I think of myself not only as an ally and an advocate and an artist and a social worker, but also as a harm reductionist or a developing compassionate pragmatist. And it may seem strange to see someone up here talking about recovery today. It's not what you usually hear about. We hear about disease. We hear about brain disorder. We hear about trauma. I love what Bill White has to say about it. Bill White says that we have libraries filled thousands of books in many buildings of books on addiction, but you got a small shelf about what recovery looks like. My own story of recovery is a little bit different than Judy's. My story includes abstinence. My story includes 12-step programs. I'm grateful for that. But I also realized that the beliefs and the foundations of my personal recovery are very narrow. I think about recovery and have this picture in my mind that recovery is a lifeboat. You know, everyone's in it together. You try to stay in the middle. You don't want to fall off the side. You don't want to jump out and start swimming by yourself out there. There are sharks out there. Some of them have handcuffs, <laughs> Chief McKenzie. <laughs> These narrow views about one path that leaves folks out of the lifeboat. Fend for themselves. So I want to just share with you some of the changes that I've made in my beliefs and how they inform the way that I meet with people. The way that I meet with clients. The way that I meet with policymakers. The way I meet with politicians. The way that I meet with people who might see the work that we do very differently than we do. So what was I wrong about? First thing I was wrong about was that I believed that abstinence equaled recovery, and I was wrong. When I introduce myself at places like this, I say, my name is Glenn Simpson. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and what that means for me and my family is that I haven't had a drink or a drug since September 25th of 2014. I say long-term recovery because this has been a process for me for over 30 years. I did a three-decade field study in alcohol and drug addiction. You know, I now understand that the normal course of the disorder that we're talking about, for most people, and for myself included, includes falling down, getting up, falling down, getting up. Call it relapse, reoccurrence of symptoms. I remember I was 21 years old. I'm sitting in a psychiatrist's office. He's got his big fancy wooden desk and all his fancy little plaques behind him. And I could see what he was writing down. I'm looking over. He wrote two words, chronic relapser. There was a part of me that thought maybe I'm not much more than that. Recently, I ran into a counselor that I'd met when I was a young man. I was, I think, 25 when I'd met him. I'd been ordered, court ordered into counseling. Been many years since I had seen him. And he came up to me and he asked me, Glenn, what could I have said to you back then so things might have been different for you? I knew immediately <laughs> what to say, you know. There was nothing that he could have said or done at that point. He seemed a bit disappointed <laughs> in my answer, but 
Actually, he did help me because my recovery started that day 29 years ago because on some level, I understood that the way that I drank and then the way that I drugged was different than the earth people out there. I believe that that was the moment that I stepped into my own recovery. What is it that counselors and therapists and clinicians say to a client who they're seeing again? Glenn, you've been in detox 13 times this year. What's going to be different this time? I never say that to folks. It's all this time. It is all this time. Nearly a thousand years ago, that word recover meant to regain consciousness. To regain consciousness. How often does each of us regain consciousness in our lifetimes? How many times do we actually just wake up? Recovery is about regaining consciousness, learning how to sustain consciousness. I recently had the opportunity to speak with Dr. John Kelly at the uh, uh, symposium down in, in Cape Cod about this study that, that he had completed. And I think his research gives a really hopeful view of, of recovery. You know, hopeful for uh, you know, a disorder that's also, also called you know, chronic and relapsing. The reality is that more than 23 million people in the United States with a substance use disorder do recover. And the research shows that relapses are finite. So what I know about recovery is that it's not marked by the last date one used, but rather it's a journey. And recovery is not only possible, recovery is probable. So if I was wrong about abstinence, my belief around legacy programs and you know, I believe that legacy programs were the only path to recovery, and I was wrong. I want to talk about this a little bit because in some of the circles I travel in, uh, this can be a very difficult conversation. I came up through legacy programs. My name is Glenn, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, my name is Glenn, and I'm a drug addict. When I was first coming around, there was no Suboxone, there was no recovery residences. Basically, you got out of treatment, they gave you a meeting list, and a $22,000 big book. I still have mine. I paid enough for it, right? In many ways. Abstinence and legacy programs worked for me in our one great path. But even Bill Wilson, who was the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Warned, he said the greatest threat to their program was not folks using drugs. The greatest threat to their program was a dogmatic approach to recovery. There are many paths to recovery. It's only through educating ourselves, listening to other people's experiences about all their different paths, including no path, it can make us more effective clinicians, make us more effective advocates. If I stay in my abstinence-only silo, I will not succeed in meeting people where they are. So what I've come to know, there's no one path. There's no one right path. There are many paths to the top of this mountain. So if there were these other paths that I didn't understand, and I'm getting it all wrong anyway, right? One path I didn't understand was medication-assisted treatment. Early in my own journey, I believe that MAT was just switching seats on the Titanic. And I was wrong. I've come to understand that this view is harmful it's stigmatizing, and it keeps people out of potentially helpful programs and healing communities. It's the gold standard for treatment. 
I urge recovery residences to accept MAT as the standard of care so that everyone has access if that's what they want. Access for medication-assisted treatment must be an option. It must be an affordable option for everyone, everywhere. And that includes prisons and jails. With all that being said, we can't just accept MAT as the only focus of care, right? So many folks that I talk to, family members, folks working on the front lines, first responders, they, they all want that silver bullet that's going to fix this problem, right? Let's remember this, okay? Let's remember this. But the drug manufacturers who made billions of dollars creating and being complicit in this humanitarian crisis are also benefiting from MAT. While we've helped decrease stigma by sometimes calling substance use disorder a disease, we have in some ways provided a new opportunity to stigmatize people if we require that everyone only take MAT to the exclusion of looking at the psychosocial stressors of what it means to be human. What I've come to know is this. MAT is one important part of recovery along with addressing people's social, psychological, and spiritual needs. So while I knew very little about MAT, I knew even less about overdose prevention sites. I believe that, that overdose prevention sites was counterintuitive to the sort of work that we were trying to accomplish. And I was wrong. It wasn't that long ago that I just started researching OPS, start to educate myself a little bit, found that the data was crystal clear. Overdose prevention sites save lives. Recovery is also about harm reduction and keeping people alive so they can recover. And overdose prevention sites keep people alive. They provide education. They test and treat diseases. And that's the place where someone is going to feel safe enough to ask for help if that's what they want to do. There's 20 countries around the world that are doing this work. Overdose prevention sites work. People don't die or, or use more drugs because of an overdose prevention site. People live. So what I've come to know is that overdose prevention sites keep people alive, and we need them now in the United States. So congratulations to the activists and the advocates and the social workers and the allies in Philadelphia for the work that they've been doing. The last three things I want to talk to you about changed my beliefs, and they came as a direct result of my formal education, being engaged in giving and receiving therapy. You've got to do your own work first. But I had to experience these last three things in, to change my beliefs, to really understand them on a visceral level. First, I believed that labels didn't matter, that words didn't matter, because I called myself by those names. Hi, I'm Glenn, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, I'm Glenn, I'm a drug addict. Good to see you. I didn't think it was stigmatizing, and I was wrong. I totally believe what that psychiatrist said when he, when he wrote that down. Chronic relapse, sir. The shame, the low expectations that I had of myself and I thought others had of me in some ways continue to whisper to me. 
Someone once called the stigmatizing effect of language as the soft bigotry of lowered expectations. Research has shown us that language and labels are stigmatizing. And stigma reduces a person's chances of recovery. That's data, not opinion. We need to teach others to use non-stigmatizing language in the media, in the doctor's office, in your church, within your family, and in politics in order to change this perception that substance use disorder is some sort of moral failure. And I'll say this, labels are tricky. We need to constantly reevaluate and regularly do a, a language audit. It's important. But let's also not become so obsessed with using the right words that we forget about discrimination entirely. Judy said to me, go ahead, call me a junkie. Just give me that house. What I've come to know this, language matters. Stigma is harmful. And appropriate language can be taught and adopted in all settings. And we have an obligation to do that. Another insight that I want to share with you folks has really changed the way that I practice with others, the way that I treat others, the way that I look at my own personal story. I believe that ambivalence in recovery was not okay. And I was wrong. Like so many people here, I'm a social worker. We are inherently fixers. We've been fixing stuff since Sally fell off the jungle gym in the fourth grade. Sally, you need a Band-Aid? Let's get you to treatment. <laughs> fixing doesn't help, folks. We know that, right? Sitting with the ambivalence of addiction, that can be really tough, but it's not only necessary, well, it's not only possible, it's necessary, right? What we need to do is provide acceptance, compassion, and dignity. And as a teacher of mine has said, just a dash of curiosity. Substance use is on a continuum of risk, right? So our goal is move toward reduced risk in small incremental steps. The person who uses the substance, they're the expert. Judy's the expert of her own life. As social workers, we want to hurry up with our goals and get our treatment plans. But in the therapeutic alliance, goal setting is coming way down the line. After we establish that relationship, after we embrace the ambivalence of it all, it's in the room with us. It's only then that we can help people come up with the type of changes that they want to make. They're not lost waiting to be discovered. We got folks that are just looking to recreate themselves. Now how do we do this? By active listening, empathetic reflection, and most importantly, by observing our own reactions and observing our own biases. In my own personal story, I had to embrace ambivalence. I've embraced the not knowing. It's hanging out with me up here today. It's my companion. It's given me self-compassion, freedom to trust, a little bit of confidence. Ten years ago, when I decided to check into a hotel room and drink and drug myself to death, there was no room for ambivalence. Three years later, my only companion was shame. What I've come to know is this, ambivalence needs to be embraced. It's good. It allows me to start where people are, where I am. And we need to trust in the process of embracing that ambivalence. 
And finally, as I, as I peel more and more layers away and more and more gray hairs pop up, I realized I was wrong about something else. I really feel like I needed to talk about it today. It sort of came to me on the way in here. I didn't think that my white male privilege affected my view of the people I worked with. I didn't think that my white male privilege affected my view of the epidemic that we're experiencing in our community. And I was wrong. I can, I can remember where like the seeds of this idea were planted for me. It was my first day here at the University of New England, 48 years old, getting my master's degree. We did this thing, and many of you may, may have done this before, the privilege walk. Folks done that before? We're doing the privilege walk. And that realization hit me. Like, you know, spiritual awakenings come in rude awakenings. That realization hit me that being a heterosexual white male gave me privilege in spite of the fact that I grew up in an addicted and abusive home. It was a real turning point for me in my understanding of how people are treated, how policies are made, how the opioid epidemic is only now being called that because it's killing rich white kids. Understanding this white male privilege also opened me up to, it opened me up to empathizing with how desperately some white males are holding on to this privilege as they come to terms with it slipping away. I have a responsibility to listen to that too. I heard Brene Brown say something interesting recently. She said that white male privilege is making its last stand. Last stands are long. <laughs> Last stands are violent. Last stands are bloody. Speaking of ambivalence, right? So I have this anger about what's happening in our communities. I also have this optimism about what's happening in our communities. Like holding both of those things. I guess you could say I'm Pistamistic. <laughs> We're going to hear about white male policymakers and how they're criminalizing pregnant women, particularly low income women and women of color. We're going to hear about that today. We know the imprint of all of this is trauma. The policies that require women like Judy to complete 18 months of treatment and clean urine screens so she can take her kid to fun town are at the least unreasonable and at the most are cruel and show an aggressive disinterest in those mothers and in those children. So what I've come to know is this, white male privilege has to be acknowledged and it has to be addressed by men that look like me. And finally, I'd like to say that I'm also in lifelong learning, lifelong learning. What I've shared with you is constantly evolving. But I can tell you this, I and many others believe that as a culture, what we're experiencing now are what some people call the diseases of despair. Suicide and substance use disorder are the top two. And while genetics and brain changes play a role, the root causes are stress, trauma, poverty, and stigma. 
and I think most importantly, disconnection. We are a society that's literally dying from despair, literally dying from disconnection. So how are we going to come together as a community, a state, a nation, to stop the dying? We're going to be hearing lots of great ideas today. But let us remember this, that in order to be successful, the I has got to become the we. If our foundational beliefs, if our semantics, and the need to be right continue to direct us within this community, we're not going to get anywhere. We're not going to make any progress. We need to connect. We need to come together, find some mutual goals, and get out of our tiny silos of right position. Let's remove ourselves from the circular firing squads that happen in social media between all of us. Because while we argue, people are dying. We gotta listen. We gotta connect. That's where the whole idea of the puzzle project came from. How do we connect? The same engagement skills that we teach clinicians. Listening with no agenda. Having empathy for others' experiences. And challenging our own beliefs. Those are the skills that we need to put to use in this room today. And by that same token, we need to know and tell others that we are the experts. We know the effects of incarceration. We know about the stigma of not being able to find employment. We know about the stigma of not being able to find affordable housing. We know about the outrageous health care costs. We know about the inaccessibility of treatment, the inaccessibility of naloxone, the inaccessibility of family support. We know the barriers and the burdens of debt. We know the discrimination that follows this disorder. We also know that as the opioid deaths decrease in some states, they're increasing among people of color. We know that meth and cocaine are on the rise in our communities. We know that fentanyl is finding its way into press pills, vaping devices, and other drugs. So what do we do? We need to mobilize. We need to mobilize recovery. We need to participate in the political rooms, the recovery hallways, in the streets. We need to be active in the research. We need to be able to talk the science. We need to fight the legal battles. And we need to decide where the settlement money is used. Let's be active in society's recovery, not just our own individual recovery. So let's tell our stories. If we just sit back in our privilege, argue our right positions, or give up, they will continue to die. And they are we, and together we're stronger, together we're louder. And as Judy told me that last day that I saw her get on that bus, she said, I can and I will recover. And I'll recover loudly. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you all so much. Your harm reduction rock stars. Thank you, Chris Hall. Thank you, Zoe. Uh, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, UNE. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you.